Hi, my name is Ranger Caitlin, and welcome to Andersonville National Historic Site and the National Prisoner of War Museum, which serves as a memorial to all American prisoners of war. As visitors travel throughout the museum, they explore themes related to the prisoner of war experience, captivity, living conditions, communication, morale, and freedom. Under the Geneva Conventions, POWs only had to give their name, rank, and serial number. However, interrogators would often try to trick POWs through clever questioning. As a signer of the Geneva Conventions and fearful of reprisals against German POWs held in the United States, Germany generally adhered to all measures outlined for the humane treatment of prisoners. However, Germany's ally, Japan, did not sign or adhere to the Geneva Conventions, so POWs were treated very poorly in the Pacific Theater. After processing, American POWs held in Germany were sent to camps, most notably Stalags. These camps were run by the Luftwaffe, or German pilots, and were initially intended to hold Air Force prisoners. During this time, the Luftwaffe guards often had the reputation of being slightly less brutal than SS guards because they were pilots themselves and had a degree of professional respect towards their fellow flyers. On June 6, 1944, Allied troops invaded the beaches of Normandy, Operation Overlord, to take France over from German occupation. After D-Day, as Allied forces moved in on Germany, the Nazi SS guards took over the operation at prisoner of war camps. After this change, rations were reduced, discipline was harder, and the privileges were withheld. On December 16, 1944, the Battle of the Bulge launched Germany's last major effort in a military counteroffensive against Allied forces. A day later, Waffen SS units captured and murdered more than 80 U.S. soldiers and became known as the Malmedy Massacre. During this event, the 1st SS Panzer Division converged on a U.S. convoy of the 285th Field Artillery Observation Battalion. As the units met, the SS opened fire on U.S. troops. After surrendering and being searched, the U.S. troops were lined up in rows in an open field where they were shot and killed. Others, who appeared to be alive, were shot again. Shortly after the Malmedy Massacre, the 1st SS Division were alerted to 11 men from the 333rd Field Artillery Battalion who had escaped after the Battle of the Bulge to a nearby town. The 333rd was a segregated African-American unit during World War II. These 11 African-American artillerymen were found and taken into the forest where they were savagely beaten, tortured, and killed. This became known as the Worth Massacre. Both of these massacres have been seen by U.S. investigators as atrocities, and these mistreatments continued throughout the war. The 332nd Fighter Group of B-51 pilots were the U.S. Army Air Force's first black flying group and were no stranger to prejudice. The Red Tails, named for their distinctive painted tail on their aircraft, had overcome institutional racism in their own country and proved themselves to be highly competent flyers and protectors of the bombers and were now also facing captivity in Nazi Germany who regarded African Americans as racially inferior. Conditions worsened for all POWs as the war drew to a close. Malnutrition, overcrowding, lack of shelter, and medical treatment were all common. Prisoners were generally provided with meager rations for the day, so hunger was a big part of POW life. Many prisoners look forward to deliveries from Red Cross packages, such as the ones next to me, with luxury items such as chocolate, dried fruits, and vegetables. During their captivity, it took tremendous will and ingenuity to keep morale up and boredom away. Some prisoners wrote letters home and wrote in wartime logs. They drew pictures of their daily lives and handmade items. These artifacts in our museum collection are functioning tributes to the human spirit and innovation when it refuses to succumb to despair. During this video series, we have been following the 100th Bomb Group story. Major Gail Buck Clevin of the 100th was academically trained as an astrophysicist prior to the war and taught advanced calculus to his fellow prisoners to pass the time, while others participated in theater productions or sports. During its 22 months in combat, the 100th Bomb Group flew 306 missions, lost 732 airmen who were declared killed or missing in action, and another 923 had been taken as prisoners of war. As the war dragged on, it became clear that Germany was losing, and the SS began forcing POWs inland to avoid Allied forces on what were known as death marches, which sometimes lasted weeks. Many prisoners died during these death marches from poor conditions, exhaustion, and execution.
Hi, my name is Christine. I'm the museum technician here at Andersonville National Historic Site. And as we continue our deep dive into World War II, we wanted to share some of our artifacts that are here on exhibit in the museum, as well as a couple things that are off exhibit. So we hope you enjoy this up close look at some of our artifacts. The first is a crystal radio that was made by Staff Sergeant Lonnie B. Rutledge. Staff Sergeant Rutledge was part of the 100th Bomb Group 351st Bombardment Squadron. Crystal radios are made up of wire for the antenna, a coil of wire to help transmit the electromagnetic frequency, a capacitator or crystal detector now known as a diode, and an earphone. All of these materials would have been accessible to a POW with a little ingenuity and could be made quickly. A rusty nail, a corroded penny, an actual crystal, and any and other items could be used to create the crystal detector. Crystal detectors were extremely helpful for Allied soldiers and POWs due to their ability to not be detectable since they lacked components that would give away their location if using a normal radio. They also served as a morale booster. Staff Sergeant Rutledge was a POW at Stalag 17B and was eventually transferred to Stalag Luft 17A, more commonly referred to as Mooseburg, which was where many of the airmen from the 100th Bomb Group and others were liberated in April of 1945. Another object in the museum that shows the ingenuity of POWs is this blower stove that was donated by Harold Page. Blower stoves could be made from many things. This one was made from milk and liver pate cans saved from Red Cross packages. The fan belt was made from woven bits of thread and the grate was made from barbed wire. The way that the stoves would work was one side had a space where you could add wood or cardboard to burn, which then would be connected by an air shaft with a blower pot and a crank and then the fan blade to stoke the fire. The pulley would be attached to the crank with the fans under the fire pot bringing more air in to heat things faster. Also in relation to the 100th Bomb Group, we have a donation from Tech Sergeant John Legg of the 349th Bombardment Squadron. Tech Sergeant Legg was a waste gunner on the plane Big Time Operator, but for his 18th mission to Berlin on May 24, 1944, they used a different plane called Times of Wasting. Unfortunately, during that flight, Tech Sergeant Legg and the rest of his crew were shot down and taken as POWs by the Germans. The two items that Tech Sergeant Legg donated to us are from his time as a POW. He donated a German knapsack and a Red Cross provisions box. The knapsack may have potentially either been a souvenir to take home as a memento of his captivity, and the Red Cross boxes would have been a common sight in many of the camps where once their contents was used, they could have potentially ended up being used to create items like the blower stove we talked about earlier. In his memoir, Tech Sergeant Legg recounts his time as a POW and mentions being interrogated at, the, at Dulag Luft and moved to various camps before being forced marched to Mooseburg, where he was liberated on April 29, 1945. Andersonville National Historic Site is only one of 10 sites on the Georgia World War II Heritage Trail that shares the stories of American soldiers during the war. Thank you for joining us on this video series as we honor these American heroes from the war during the 80th anniversary of D-Day.